friends to the end. Ain't we, my friend? We kind of blend together coffee and cream. Boy, what a team! Oh, hello there. How's it going? Did you enjoy the Super Bowl? How about that Iowa caucus, eh? Coin flip. I really need to write these videos faster. So I guess after I made my last video about animal allegories and metaphors in fiction, a few of you wanted me to check out a new show called Beastars that covers some similar ground. And by a few of you, I mean I got comments about it every single day up until the release of this video. So for the past month, I've watched all 12 currently released episodes of the anime and all 17 currently released volumes of the manga. I've compiled 18 pages of notes, and yes, I regret to inform you all, I have thoughts. Why don't you guys tell me about all the f So originally this video was exclusively going to be just a 10 to 15 minute thing talking about this cute throwaway cartoon show in response to all the requests I've been getting for the last month. But from delving more into the source material, I found something unexpected. Beastars is actually really good. Like, really good. In fact, it might actually be one of the most complex and fascinating fantasy worlds I've seen in the last few years. I think I might stan it. I'm a Beastars stan now. There are just so many moving parts to the whole thing, and I think the story does some incredibly interesting things, especially in relation to some of the things I've criticised in the past. Now, while I have read the entire series at this point and would love to get right into it, for reasons I'll delve into at the end of the video, I've decided this video is only going to focus on what's been covered in the anime. So, for now, don't worry if you haven't read the manga. But, you know, Maybe if this video gets you thinking about stuff, you should read it in the next few weeks. Maybe, I don't know, maybe I'll have something to say about it. So buckle up, put on your fursuit, and let's get right into the news! If there's one thing someone who's already a fan of Beastars doesn't want to see in an analysis video, it's an opening that directly compares it to Zootopia. The idea of Beastars as a dark take on the 2016 Disney movie has been so rife in both fan discussions and marketing that it honestly feels like a waste of breath at this point. Even ignoring that this story has been in development since long before Zootopia's release, Outside of pointing out the surface level similarities, they really explore their subject matter in completely different ways and aren't worth directly comparing. Anyway, let's directly compare Beastars and Zootopia. Beastars definitely represents a kind of meeting point for a lot of different issues I covered in my last video. If you didn't watch it, I essentially took a look at the ways animal allegory is used in fiction to talk about a variety of social issues, and in particular issues of race. Ringing Bell, a story using predator-prey analogies to talk about nature versus nurture. You Are a Masu, a story using predator-prey analogies to talk about bigotry. And of course, Zootopia a story using predator-prey analogies to talk about bigotry also. With more furry stuff. Whoops, did I just say furry stuff? Beastars time. Hey yo, what the f- So yeah, Beastars tells the story of a society that's on the surface a lot like that of Zootopia. It's a society what has animal people in it, and the animal people have jobs, and clothes, and schools, and strip clubs. Just like Zootopia. And in amongst this, there is Lugosi, a shy grey wolf student of the prestigious Cherryton Academy. He is best boy, he is precious, and he is pure. Except for his insatiable desire to consume the flesh of his fellow students, more specifically a rabbit co-ed named Haru, who he develops an immediate crush on. This is really where Beastars distinguishes itself from Zootopia, and where things get really interesting. See, as I talked about in my last video, Zootopia is very explicit in what specific contemporary human issues it's trying to use these animal metaphors to address. When Officer Judy Hobbs tries to enter the male-dominated police force and is quickly shrugged off as being too frail and ineffectual to do real police work, 
there's some pretty clear parallels being made to institutional sexism. When predators start being discriminated against as dangerous thugs who should go back to where they came from, there's some clear links being made to racist scaremongering, particularly in the US. And to avoid delivering a message that's kind of the opposite of what was intended, the film makes clear that all of this was bigoted and irrational. Judy is a perfectly good officer, regardless of her species, and predators are perfectly kind and peaceful regardless of theirs. Now, in my last video, I went over how the underlying message of that allegory is still kind of weird, even with these attempts to write them off. My voice cracks, sorry. But here I just want to highlight something simple. In Zootopia, Predators and prey have long enlightened themselves beyond any actual need or desire to eat each other. In Beastars... Well... <laughs> so there are two basic truths that fundamentally change what we're working with in the story of Zootopia vs Beastars. Number one. In Zootopia, carnivores have no particular desire to consume their prey peers, and this is in part due to number two. Also in Zootopia, there are plenty of meat sources for carnivores that don't involve basically killing a person. Having been incessantly spammed questions about it in the years since its release, Zootopia director Byron Howard has informed us that carnivores in the film get their meat from... Reconstituted plant protein, insects, and fish. And luckily, just like in the real world, fish don't really have feelings, or care if you kill them. <laughs> At least as far as the story shows us, carnivores have no real craving or compulsion to kill. In this way, the use of animal allegory is purely an external one, more about in-group, out-group mentalities and the prejudices we hold about others. So with no dietary issues or sinister urges, the animals of Zootopia are essentially animals in appearance alone. In their thoughts and their feelings, they are simply people. Beastars? Not so much. <laughs> Whether carnivores or herbivores, predator or prey, the society of Beastars is one filled with primal, animalistic compulsions and desires. With the sale of any kind of meat outside of insects outright banned in their society, Beastars meat eaters are explicitly shown on multiple occasions to be drawn towards the consumption of prey animals, even having an expansive black market that helps keep the insatiable cravings of the carnivores at bay. As the story goes on, it's even suggested prey animals have a similar compulsion to be consumed. Predation incidents, whether accidental or deliberate, are increasingly common and difficult to police. The social conflicts of Beastars are not purely arbitrary. They are, seemingly, in a very literal way, baked into the brains of these characters. This is where we get psychological and horny. As I say, the first season of Beastars, covering the manga's first major arc, revolves mainly around Lugosi's struggles, dealing with his inexplicable romantic crush slash barely contained bloodlust for one of the other students the rabbit girl Haru. Alongside all this, a member of Lugosi's drama club gets murdered, he gets in a fight to the death with a tiger during a school play, he's kidnapped by an old panda bear wielding a crossbow, and then, in the end, he fights his way through a lion mafia to save Haru from being eaten. So it might be weird when I tell you that one of the most important stories of the season is about a chicken laying an egg. Bear with me for a second. In amongst growing tensions about the death of a student and Lugosi being kidnapped by a bear, Episode 7, Below the Cloves and the Fur, opens with a story about a hen named Lagome. Lagome is a seemingly throwaway character to the season overall, a classmate of Lugosi's who never really engages with the main plot. But one thing she does engage with is pooping out eggs. In the world of Beastars, alongside soy burgers and ant shakes, carnivores mainly live off of non-meat animal products like milk and eggs. And there's a kind of business arrangement where cows and chickens can consent to selling what they produce, either with a company or freelance. 
Legome is once a chicken, selling eggs for the school cafeteria's midweek egg sandwiches, and she takes extra pride in doing so. Her entire lifestyle, from diet to exercise, is geared around producing the tastiest possible eggs for others to consume. And when she finds out Legosi not only eats, but has a particular love for her egg sandwiches, this gives her an incredible amount of pleasure. Despite taking up a fair chunk of the episode, the story is pretty easy to forget, with minimal conflict aside from some brief mix-up about Legome's eggs being sold on the wrong days. And honestly, if this brief aside had been left out of the anime adaptation entirely, I don't think I would have noticed. But I think there's a good reason the showrunners decided to take time out of the show's main plot to tell this story. And it's not just to introduce the fun detail about how the society gets its eggs. It works to underline one of the story's most fundamental social critiques. How we look at deviance. Wait, uh, sorry for the interruption. So, this video is actually sponsored by Skillshare. At this point, you probably know who they are since they've been generously supporting my work for like a year now, but in case you don't, they're an online learning tool offering educational classes on a bunch of different topics, from art to design to animation and video editing. One of the ones I really enjoyed in 2019 was a series by Julian Klepper on low-budget filmmaking. It goes through the whole process of writing, casting, production, and actually really helped get me creatively motivated last year. That and classes like it are all available on the site, with more being added over the year. Wow! So, if any of that sounds interesting to you, Skillshare is actually offering two free months of premium membership to the first 500 people who click the link in this video's description. That makes an annual subscription less than 10 bucks a month, which is pretty good for all the classes they offer. So give them a shot if you want to help out the channel and maybe explore your own creativity. Sorry for interrupting your sexy wolves. In media analysis, there are many different schools of thought as far as ways to examine art and fiction. Popular schools include feminism, examining the representation of gender and gender roles, Marxism, which looks at how media portrays class and class divides, and formalism, which is the lame one for nerds. And then there's queer theory, which is a really valuable way of looking at art, with a pretty shit name I unfortunately have to use because it's still the academic standard. A common understanding of queer theory is that it's used to look at how sexualities like gay or straight are portrayed in fiction, the same way feminism looks at gender. For instance, you could do what Renegade Cut has done, looking at how 80s action movies typically code heroism as stereotypically masculine and heterosexual, while villainy is coded as feminine Isabel. and gay. Within the first few minutes of the film, Matrix mocks 80s musician Boy George, calling him Girl George and Subversive, a word commonly used among authoritarian states to denounce anything against the state's status quo. I myself have also done a series on how gay coding works in media, focusing on 90s cartoons. But it's important to keep in mind what we mean when we even say gay coding in the first place. Because ultimately, we are taking a group of seemingly arbitrary attitudes and behaviours and labelling them as gay. Why would a man dressing flamboyantly or being extremely emotionally expressive indicate gay coding? It's because, at the root of it, Queer theory isn't just about how we depict sexualities. It's also about how we identify and distinguish normative and deviant behaviour. How does a society jump from general descriptions of behaviour to specific prescriptions about what's normal and unusual? So what does this have to do with Beastars? Well, mainly because across all of my analysis, I'm going to make the bold claim that Beastars is a profoundly queer text. And I want to make clear I'm not only talking about sexuality, even if the gay certainly shows up. If that were the case, I think it's hard to work out what this random story about a chicken laying an egg is really telling us, or why it's worth highlighting. What's important to remember is that in the first place, the root of queerness isn't just in sexuality, it's in perceived strangeness. So here's my take. 
Beastars is fundamentally about what strange really means. About how society dictates normative and deviant behaviours. So there's a name for Legome's primal desire to produce the tastiest eggs to satisfy her classmates. Fetish. She has a particular fetish for that particular behaviour, in the same way Lugosi comes to find out he has a fetish for prey. The difference is Lugosi's fetish is one that's been identified as deviant, illegal and immoral, while Lugome's isn't just tolerated by society, but outright encouraged and financially incentivized. There is, very explicitly, a societal judgement about which of these natural compulsions is normal and which is strange. So, in comparison to Lugosi's story of shame, self-hatred, alienation and resentment, Lugome's story is one of mild dissatisfaction and minimal real conflict. The fact that this story is so straightforward and forgettable is the point because Legome's primal desires are seen as normal, and Legosi's are not. The first season of Beastars has an interesting dynamic, wherein it's focused simultaneously on two things that seem totally contradictory. On the one hand, the large, intimidating Grey Wolf Lugosi has to deal with his blooming romantic feelings for a small female herbivore. On the other hand, Lugosi has to deal with the fact that by the day he grows more and more desperate to eat her. Surely these must be entirely separate emotions. Love and hate, or at least indifference. As it turns out, highlighting the uncomfortable connections between these situations, both psychologically and societally, isn't just an incidental part of this story. It's the entire focus. As far as the people around Lugosi, relationships between carnivores and herbivores, especially couples so disparate as a grey wolf and a bunny rabbit, are constantly treated with intense suspicion and derision. This is something that goes way deeper in the manga, but even in this season we get scenes like the moment Lugosi and Haru have a public argument, and the immediate assumption is made that Lugosi is trying to hurt her, or the disgust shown by fellow wolf Juno that Lugosi would reject one of his own kind for some scrawny herbivore. Of course, it goes without saying that his desire to eat Haru is treated similarly, seeing as in that case he'd risk jail time just for admitting it. Bear in mind that while all this is going on, there's an ongoing investigation about a consumed student and no leading suspects, which remains the case until much later in the story. To be continued. To covet and consume seem like very different things but are both treated as similarly deviant behaviours. Yet, at the same time, relationships between herbivores and carnivores aren't strictly banned from society. Cherryton Academy is, pointedly, not a segregated school, and nor is Lugosi identified as deviant simply for being a carnivore. Far from it, Lugosi is frequently encouraged by those around him to embrace more of his natural carnivorous strength, to be more confident and open. His identity as a carnivore is seen as natural, just as the desire for carnivores and herbivores to form relationships is seen as natural. Kind of. Of course, same species couples are still deeply prized and seen as more natural. Of course, the second any kind of crime is committed by a carnivore, these mixed species couples are harshly scrutinised, and carnivores are broadly treated with hostility even by those close to them. Of course, carnivores are still expected to act and think in a highly specific, acceptable form lest the thin veil of tolerance be lifted and bigoted accusations suddenly thrown at them. Beastars demonstrates that, in fact, this tolerant society is a highly controlled and mediated one, with a definition of normal, natural behaviour much more restrictive than it may appear. The allowance for deviation is far more flimsy than it originally seems, 
sensitive to sudden and dramatic shifts based on the most subtle changes in social conditions. And that's one thing Beastars arrives at, that this was always kind of the case. Deviance is not a fixed or objective qualifier, not in Beastars and not in our own world. Even where it's most commonly referred to in sexual psychology, the debate over what qualifies as healthy or deviant sexual preferences is a long-standing and messy one. Most famously, being gay was long seen as a form of sexual deviance, to the point where it was listed in the American Psychiatric Association's list of mental illnesses until the mid-70s. Sigmund Freud said homosexual desires were rooted in non-normative relations to the Oedipal complex, because of course he did, and for some reason, people cared what he had to say at the time. Personally, I blame Bill and Ted. I demand I'm a lawyer. The thing is, what does it really mean for us to now classify being gay as a normal variant of human sexuality? Like, did we just study people's brains hard enough and find out, oh wait, look, it's normal. It was never about commonality, the number of gay people never dictated whether it was classified as deviant. Was it about conditions associated with distress and or problems dealing with social work or family activities, as the American Psychiatric Association now defines mental illness? Plenty of gay people today could still say their sexuality brings them all those problems. Did I say sexuality? Typically now, when we talk about deviance, we talk about what departs from an accepted or expected norm. The hard reality is that, as with many things, these norms are ultimately subjective, dependent on cultures and societies they're a part of. Indigenous two-spirit cultures existed long before modern conceptions of transgender identity, and the colonial response was to judge this as strictly immoral and have those accepting of it punished or killed. This is the social commentary of Beastars, that the question of what we think of when we think of accepted and unaccepted norms is a hard one. So yes, it makes sense for the carnivorous compulsion to consume prey to be demonized, even if it's something we're clearly shown carnivores struggling with daily. Yes, it makes sense for there to be concerns about carnivore-herbivore relationships, given knowledge of the capability and desire of many carnivores to consume. But at the same time, this compulsion to shame and ostracize these feelings and behaviors often just kind of leaves herbivores in a constant state of fear and distrust, and carnivores in a constant state of torment and self-hatred. Self-harm is explicitly referred to as common practice among carnivores struggling with their natural impulses. The lion mayor of the city the story takes place in got millions of dollars of facial surgery just to not look as much like a carnivore. Incidentally, lions with human-looking teeth look fucking terrifying, so good work on that one, chief. And then, crucially, there's the school play much of the early episodes revolve around, which kind of coyly dig into the anxieties of both carnivores and herbivores. We see the herbivore audience delight in this fantasy of a red deer lead as this strong, empowered hero, defeating hordes of carnivorous monsters and showing, at least implicitly, that they need not feel like weak and helpless prey. By contrast, the tiger Bill alienates and confuses this audience in his efforts to take over the lead role and empower carnivores by showing that they can be proud of who they are. Lugosi cannot stand this, in part because of what he knows to be true, that carnivores can't be empowered, can't be proud, because in Bill's pride, he sees all the natures of a carnivore that make them so thoroughly rejected in this society. Bill's response is to carve deep scars into Lugosi's back, to remind him that they are fundamentally one and the same. That by rejecting Bill's nature, he is also rejecting his own. When Bill reveals he'd been dosing up on rabbit blood before the performance, Lugosi indicates it's this act alone that upsets him, but this isn't really the case. What he really hates is that Bill indulged in his temptations, because Lugosi knows full well he wants to do the same. 
Lugosi can't pray away his carnivorous desires, no matter how much of his self-loathing he takes out on others. The question of if Lugosi truly loves Haru, if he even really has the capacity to truly love Haru, remains in the air up until the finale of the show's first season, and at the risk of minor manga spoilers, is still kind of in contention. When Lugosi speaks with G- G- Gohin. Gohin. He is told flat out that his attraction to Haru is based purely on crossed wires from his own predatory instincts, and that his continued presence around her only puts her in further and further danger. Certainly the fact that Lugosi seems to have such strong feelings for her despite knowing basically nothing about her kind of lends itself to that. Regardless, this is not a truth Lugosi is willing to accept. He is willing to fight, even to the death, to prove that his love for Haru is honest, and comes from him as an individual, and not as a result of some murderous natural urge. <laughs> Ultimately, this is where the show leaves us, with the acknowledgement that in this world, as in our own, that our feelings and impulses can't be boiled down to simple classifications of right or wrong, normative or deviant. There is no narrative escape hatch which jettisons the harsh reality that some impulses and desires are harmful, even fatally so. But the point is made that maybe there can be a better option than straightforward shame, dismissal and ostracization. Maybe allowing certain issues to step into the light to be explored meaningfully and treated with care might offer something that a deviant label never could. Again, I want to make clear that I don't think Beastars works or is intended to work as a one-to-one -one allegory for homophobia or LGBT issues or mental illness or anything else. The level to which I felt Zootopia leaned hard into projecting specific contemporary human issues onto its world was definitely a criticism I had, but I think Beastars sidesteps that with a story that much more readily embraces all the realities of the setting it establishes. What's judged as deviant is often rooted in sexuality, and Beastars acknowledges that. But the prescription of deviant behaviour exists in all sorts of forms. Yes, the way herbivore-carnivore relationships are subtly dissuaded and carnivores constantly presumed as aggressors does ring true to issues of racism. But then I also think the presumption of a carnivore aggressor also calls to mind issues with male sexual assault victims frequently being assumed as perpetrators. And honestly, yeah. I do still think there's a concern of audiences extrapolating too much from these metaphors. Any commentary on Beastars as a kind of racial allegory should probably acknowledge the similarly demonised black and Latino communities don't actually have an ingrained primal tendency towards violence. And any comparison to LGBT issues should acknowledge that sexual identity isn't limited to innate biological truths. Part of why Beastars is so fascinating, and why I'm so excited to talk about it, is that I think it works on both levels. If we imagine a kind of social commentary uncanny valley, I would argue Zootopia rests around the dip, just running a little too close to commenting on specific contemporary social issues to keep viewers from noticing the cracks. Beastars hits the sweet spot. It hides the roots of its critique just well enough that it doesn't come uncomfortably close to making some fairly misguided comparisons, but remains pointed enough to remind you of the very real, brutal truths resting behind the text. So given Beastars animated adaptation has currently only covered around the first 50 or so chapters of the story, I guess there's still a ton of ground to cover here. I also haven't even touched on major elements of the story, like 
what the hell the B-Stars even are, or my best boy, Lewis. He's a cutie, he's my best friend, and he's racist. So you guessed it, I'm doing the annoying YouTuber thing. This is actually going to be part one of a multi-part series covering the entire story of Beastars up to the latest release. Rest assured, dear boy stands, Lewis will be getting a lot of discussion down the line. We're also going to be talking about nature versus nurture, we're going to be talking about class privilege and alienation, we're going to talk more about Lugosi and Haru and the nice panda man and the snake with the cool hat, and the weird nudist seal guy. Talking about ocean society in general will be pretty fun. And of course, we're gonna talk about that time Lugosi said no to biting people on the arse. This is my fight song. Take back my Until then, I hope you all enjoyed what I've had to say so far. If you want to keep updated on future videos, make sure to hit the subscribe button and please feel free to like this video and share it around to support future entries in this series. I'll still probably make them anyway, but if I get really low view numbers on this video, it'll make me mildly uncomfortable and nobody wants that. If you especially like my content, please consider throwing me a buck or two over on Patreon, or consider coffee for one-time donations. It's the only way I can keep my channel going, and it gets you on the list scrolling by now. Additional donations get you listed in these special thanks, alongside A Recusant, Callan Stein, Connor D, Kalra Ra, Gary Marshall, George Soros, Malpatuis, No More Worlds, and Torin the Exile with an extra special thanks to Charlotte Allen and Leftist Tech Support. Other than that, you can keep up with me over on Twitter at Lacking Saint, or check out my Twitch stream at twitch.tv slash Lacksaint. Links in the description. Finally, I'd like to give another thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring me on this video. Once again, please consider checking out their service for an exclusive offer on some fine, fine classes. Other than that, thanks again for watching, Love you all, and stay safe. Also, I made this. Don't really have a place for it in the video, I just made it. Oh shit, we didn't talk about the best character! There you go.